and some of the people who contributed to this book are here tonight. Uh, that's this book. This is a special anthology that was put together after the death of Amiri Baraka to acknowledge the kind of extraordinary contribution that he made. And uh, the founder of Third World Press, now Third World Press Foundation, uh, Hakim Matabuti, made a commitment at Baraka's funeral that we would gather the tribe of poets and artists and writers and put together a book that is inspired by his work and his life and also uh, in tribute to him. So we have some of those folks here um, that are going to present some of what they wrote in this book to you. Before that, though, this is um, from a new book, the other book that's up on that screen. Uh, it's called No One Can Be at Peace Unless They Have Freedom. It's actually a modification of a quote from Malcolm X, who is probably, uh, for me, the most important intellectual influence on my thinking and my practice as an activist and an artist. Um, so I'm going to read a poem. This book is poems, essays, short micro-essays, stories, all kinds of stuff in it. Uh, 1619 is the name of this poem. Cross an ocean in the belly of Jesus. Restricted motion in the belly of Jesus. No place to run in the belly of Jesus. No African sun in the belly of Jesus. We hear our breath in the belly of Jesus. We smell our sweat in the belly of Jesus. We taste our tears in the belly of Jesus. We wrestle with fear in the belly of Jesus. We search for light in the belly of Jesus. We have to fight in the belly of Jesus. We have to hide your name in the belly of Jesus and cloak your pain in the belly of Jesus and wear our stripes in the belly of Jesus and hold on to life in the belly of Jesus. Blood on the floor in the belly of Jesus. Spit on the shore from the belly of Jesus. Y'all know what happened in 1619? The first ship carrying kidnapped Africans was called the Good Ship Jesus. Landed in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. And that kind of is a way to begin this discussion of this era that we're living in and the role, the implications of black power and the black arts movement. Imagine, you all know what a tsunami is, right? This wave that begins really with an earthquake in the middle of the ocean. And you can't tell that the tsunami is there until it's actually right up on the shore, but it's moving. It's moving constantly and it's gaining strength and it's getting bigger and bigger and more powerful. And then finally it hits close to the shallow water and it becomes these massive waves. That's what happened to the Black Liberation Movement. From the very first contact with those people who sought to kidnap and harm Africans and turn them into enslaved human beings, the resistance began. And it never stopped. And it came in waves, or sometimes people say fits and starts, but it really wasn't fits and starts because it was always constant. It's just that there are moments when it was bigger. But this great struggle, that earthquake that happened with that first contact, became this huge wave in the 1950s and the 1960s that we know as the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Power Movement. And while a lot of the narrative has consistently focused on kind of big names. It really was a massive movement of working class black people. People who, if you look at the Montgomery bus boycott, is the first big mass action of the modern civil rights movement. You're talking about people who were domestic workers and laborers and cooks and people who drove taxi cabs and dug ditches and people who tended to people's lawns, to white people's lawns. These were the people of the Civil Rights Movement. And those people, like Martin Luther King, had to decide who they were going to be, because those people knew who they were. But they had to decide who they were going to be, because people like Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King was a privileged black man, came from a powerful black preacher family here in Atlanta, went to the best schools, Went to Morehouse at 15, mentored by the great educator uh, Benjamin E. Mays. Went to the Northeast to go to uh, seminary and study philosophy and German philosophers and Greek and Latin. And then he gets his first assignment as a minister in a little place called Montgomery in a little church called the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. That's a church of working class black people. And shortly after he and 
Coretta Scott King are there, this thing erupts, the Montgomery bus boycott. And so we're not confused about who Rosa Parks is. The narrative of Rosa Parks as a passive black woman is completely false. There are a couple of books that you should read. One is called The Rebellious Life of Miss Rosa Parks. But Rosa Parks began her activism as a teenager working with the NAACP. And one of her jobs with the NAACP, she was a rape investigator because nobody documented the suffering from sexual assault by white men of black women in the South. It was expected, it was ignored, it was accepted even by white women. To rape a black woman in the South meant nothing in terms of the law or their humanity. And so the NAACP set out to document their stories, to gather evidence, and to hopefully bring people to trial, which they did several times. But during that time in the, in the South, white people weren't convicted of violence against black people. You could murder a black person. You could rape a black person. You could brutalize a black person, and nobody was coming for you. Not the local sheriff, not the local mayor, not the county commission, not the governor and not the federal government. None of those people were coming for black people. Lived under a terroristic government. In the South, called Jim Crow, and in the North, it was the racism disguised as democracy. This is why Malcolm X used to say, stop talking about the South. If you South of the Canadian border, you South. Because the entire country was complicit and involved in the exploitation of black people. And one of the things we have to remember about that, which is why the relationship between black people in this country is so difficult, because black people came here for one purpose, brought here in bondage for one purpose, to be exploited for the benefit of somebody else. And this country has essentially maintained that relationship till today. That in the 21st century, we have to remind this country and the world that black lives matter. Why do we have to say that? Because we get treated as if they don't matter. And so this relationship that developed because of that initial contact, the initial purpose that black people were brought here, and we suffer from this still through all kinds of forms of economic exploitation. You all ever heard of the term environmental racism? People use that to describe the, the reason that landfills wind up in black communities and not in rich white communities, or brown communities, or Native American communities. Why a place like Flint, that is a working class city of mostly black people and poor people, why you could poison the whole city and people don't even blink an eye about it and still charge you to pay your water bill, while people who haven't been convicted of a crime wind up in jail because they can't pay the bill. They call it the money bill. In fact, Atlanta's uh, new administration just pushed through legislation to end money bill in Atlanta. It's called debtor's prison in the old text. You go before a judge and you haven't been tried or convicted of anything, but they give you bail and you say, well, I don't have money to pay bail, and they put you in jail anyway. It's unconstitutional happens every day all over the country. So this exploitative relationship, even after slavery, even after Jim Crow, continues. But this tsunami is building from that first contact on the African contact, continent. And it builds all through the 246 years of enslavement, 246 years. And in that 246 years, there was not one generation of black people who thought that slavery was our destiny. Not one. Every generation held out the hope and fought for the reality that one day we would be free. If not me, my children. If not my children, their children. If they're not their children, then their children. If not their children, then their children. But one day we will be free. For 246 years, people had the imagination to understand that this was a condition and not their destiny, which is why in African American studies, we don't say black people were slaves. We say they were enslaved human beings. 
enslaved Africans in bondage, human beings. See, because if you call somebody a slave, you've stripped away their humanity. You've made them an object, a thing, a piece of property. Because somebody has you in bondage, they don't own you. They say they do, but nobody can own you unless you let them. And in our history, that letting never happened. A lot of times it looked like it, but those were strategies to survive while people plotted their escape. Or people plotted rebellions or sabotage or thought about the future. Learning to read and write was an act of resistance that could get you killed. And so this resistance is constant and it's steady, but it builds all the way through the 246 years. Then the 12 years of Reconstruction and then the 90 years of Jim Crow. It travels through the founding of HBCUs and the 4,000 public schools that were built in the South during Reconstruction so that black people would learn how to read and write. It travels through the Garvey movement and Du Bois' double consciousness, Ida B. Wells and her anti-lynching crusade, Anna Julia Cooper crusading for black women and women in general in the 1800s. It travels through all of that. And every part of that is pushing this way further and further and harder and harder towards shore. And all the organizations and people, the NAACP, the uh, Moral Science Temple, the Nation of Islam, the Deacons for Self-Defense, all of these people are gathering in this great wave that lands on shore in 1955. And this massive movement of working class black people that have been joined by students, black students in colleges all over the South, and then white students started joining them from the north, and they began the sit-in movement all over the south, breaking down segregation in restaurants and railroads and at lunch counters. And then they went further, and they jumped on the buses and started the Freedom Rides. And then they went further, they went into Mississippi and organized Freedom Summer, registering black people to vote who have been denied their constitutional rights as citizens guaranteed by the 14th and 15th Amendment to vote organizing them to vote and to oppose the racist Mississippi Democratic Party. They formed the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And they went into Lowndes County and Selma happened and the Edmund Pettus Bridge and people all over the South and the North began to join in this great wave that brought this huge transformation to this country. Demanding human rights, demanding civil rights, Martin Luther King leading the charge with other people like Ella Baker and James Orange and Coretta Scott King, who's often overlooked as an activist who was actually more radical than Martin was when she met him. She helped him understand what he had to do. She was an artist and a thinker, a radical thinker. And after his death, she continued her activism. She marched against apartheid. She made the country recognize the first black holiday the Martin Luther King holiday, she did that. She organized this broad coalition that said we must demand recognition, not only just of Martin, but of black people's struggle for freedom in this country. It is a more relevant day to mark the struggle for freedom than the 4th of July, because that wasn't our freedom day. Black people don't sit on Jan July 3rd waiting what we call watch night. They do that on December 31st. Because December 31st, 1862, black people gathered where they could, watching for the stroke of midnight because the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect on January 1st. See, a lot of y'all go to church on New Year's Eve to watch now. You don't know why you're watching or what you're watching for. Watching for freedom. And we're still watching for it. So this tsunami gathered up all of these people Working class black people, rural black people, black people from the middle class who decided that they would stand with the masses of black people, educators, preachers, all kinds of people, artists, students. And they pushed forward this demand that the citizenship of black people be enforced by the federal government and make these southern former confederate states conform to the Constitution and make the North behave as if we were citizens. That's what civil rights means. It's the rights of citizens. That's why it's called a civil rights movement. 
Oftentimes, people mistakenly say black people got their civil rights in the civil rights movement. That's not true. Black people had civil rights, but they weren't enforced by the federal government that we paid taxes to. But civil rights was not enough because people need power in order to protect themselves and to develop themselves and to determine their own destiny and future. And so the barriers to civil rights as they're coming down, what do black people do now that they have the right to vote? The reason that they opposed the right to vote in the South was because in places like Mississippi, half the people who could vote were black people. All of those little white sheriffs and county commissioners and mayors and the governor and state legislator, if black people could vote in Mississippi, they'd be out of power. So what do you do now we have the exercise of our constitutional right? What do we do? What do we need? What do we want? We need power. We need black power. We have experienced white power. We have to, as African American people and their allies, acknowledge the fact that nobody on this entire planet is coming for black people. Nobody. And any time we expect somebody else to come for us, meaning to come and do what we need done, we're going to be disappointed. Marcus Garvey said, and then it was put in a song by Bob Marley, none but ourselves can free our minds. And the great African-American philosopher, George Clinton, <laughs> said, free your mind and what? Your ass will follow. But this notion that somehow somebody else is going to do for us is a false notion. That's why one of the demands of the 20th century, Booker T. Washington, to the Nation of Islam, do for self. Marcus Garvey, we must have our own banks, our own ships, our own schools, our own hospitals, our own doctors, our own nurses, our own army. We must have our own banks. That doesn't mean that we won't engage with other people, but if we don't have our own, we are always dependent on other people to tell us what we can have. Black power, what does that mean? When that cry goes up on the road in Mississippi in the march against fear, James Meredith, the first black student admitted to Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi, has to be escorted in the class by the National Guard and federal marshals because they want to lynch him. And he decides that he's going to march against fear from Memphis to Jackson. It's a long march. It takes several days. And as he starts out, there's a lot of reporters and stuff around. It's a symbolic march of him by himself. And a sniper in the woods tries to kill him, shoots him down on the road in Mississippi. And the entire breadth of the civil rights movement that included Congress of Racial Equality, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the NAACP, they all said we cannot allow this march to end. And so they converged in Mississippi to finish this march to Jackson. But they knew they were going to be marching by a lot of woods and a lot of places where more snipers could be in the woods to shoot them down. Martin Luther King was there, Stokely Carmichael was there, Coretta was there, Ella Baker was there. There's all kinds of people came and converged on Mississippi. And they had to sleep outside in those nights. And on one of those days, somebody asked Martin Luther King, you know, are you afraid? He said, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of death, but I'm not afraid either on this march. He said, why aren't you afraid? And I would imagine his answer was something like this. Because when we got ready to start this march, we called down to Bucaloosa, Louisiana, and asked for some brothers called the Deacons for Self-Defense and Justice to meet us on the road in Mississippi with their guns. 
and the deacons had faced down and run the clan out of Bukaloosa. Some people say that's where the dance, the Boogaloo, started. And all over the South, there's a great book written by the Department Chair of African American Studies called We Will Shoot Back, Armed Resistance in Mississippi. It talks about the fact that the narrative of the Civil Rights Movement, that black people were passive, and that we did not fight back. We fought back in many ways. The demonstration is one way of doing it. But there are other ways, too. And oftentimes, people deployed those ways. Martin Luther King was committed to nonviolence as a tactic, but he was not insane. He knew that those white sheriffs, just like they had said they would protect the Freedom Riders. And then when they got to uh, Montgomery in the bus depot, there wasn't any police or FBI or marshals were there. There was just a mob of the Ku Klux Klan that dragged people off the bus and tried to kill them. They knew this history. And so the deacons came and escorted them down to Jackson. And on the way, there used to be a chant. What do you want? Freedom. When do you want it? Now. Well, this particular night, at the end of the long march, a man who lives here in Atlanta named Willie Mukasa Wicks, who was a SNCC organizer, a close friend and colleague of Stokely Carmichael, who later was called Kwame Ture. Stokely gets up on the back of the flatbed truck with the microphone, and he says, what do we want? And Willie Wicks says, we want black power. And then Stokely says, that's right, we want black power. What do we want? And all these working class people, all these sharecroppers and people from Mississippi started yelling, we want black power. This is 1966. We want black power. We want black people to have the power to determine their own destiny. We want black people to have economic power so that they have a future that's not dependent on somebody else. We want black people to have the power to defend themselves. We want black people to have power at the ballot, to elect officials to represent our community that has never been re uh, represented in American politics. We want black power. And across the country, in Oakland, California, two college students, tired of the police harassing and intimidating and beating and brutalizing and even murdering black people in Oakland, California. Sound familiar? The brilliant young man who liked to read law books read the law and said, it's legal in California to carry a gun out in the open. It's legal in Oakland. And they formed a group called the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton. And they began to organize people to follow the police around whenever they were in the black community. And when the police would stop a black person, the Panthers would get out with a big old law book and a gun. And say, what do you stop these people for? Well, you know, we stopped them. That ain't the law. You just made that up. So it's an exercise of black power. It's not just a demand, but it's the exercise of black power. It's the exercise of freedom. And on the other side of the country, in New York City, the year before the yell of black power in Mississippi, the most important intellectual influence on this new movement, particularly of young people, was assassinated in the Audubon Ballroom. He had just come from down in Alabama where well, he went down to speak at Tuskegee while Martin Luther King was in jail in Montgomery. And the students from SNCC went over to Tuskegee and said, would you mind coming and speaking at the mass rally we have tonight in uh, Montgomery? And he said, of course I, I'm sorry, Selma, of course I'll come. And he went over there and there was a great uh, anticipation by some and trepidation by others as this six foot tall, lean man climbs out of this car and somebody walks up to Andy Young and uh, the other leaders of SCLC and says, Malcolm X is here. And they are furious at the young people. Not because he's Malcolm X. Andy Young told me some interesting stories about Malcolm X and, and the civil rights organizations, I'll tell you in a minute. But because the students had decided Malcolm was going to speak that day. And they had not conferred with anybody else, so it was a surprise to them. And so Andy goes to Coretta and says, Coretta, you got to speak. Martin is in jail. you got to speak at the mass meeting. And she said, I don't, I don't feel like speaking. He said, no, Malcolm X is here. you got to speak, because he's going to rile people up. you got to calm them back down, because, you know, 
You might have people out there doing stuff. And Coretta Scott King tells this beautiful story that Malcolm spoke, and he came and sat next to her, and he leaned over to her and said, how's Martin doing? And I want you to tell him, I'm not here to make his job hard. I'm actually here to make his job easy. I'm here to let white people know there's an alternative. Either you deal with him, or he's dealing with me. So I'm here to contrast that so sharply that they will be more willing to negotiate on the demands that you all are making. And two weeks later, Malcolm was assassinated. And Coretta Scott King said when she heard about it, it affected her physically like it was a family member. She only had that brief conversation with him. She said that she could not get over this feeling. The depth of her sorrow was so heavy. And she knew that Martin had this feeling for him, too, that Martin really appreciated the fact that Malcolm had awakened black pride in black people, a sense of loving yourself and of connection to Africa, that Malcolm had helped stand people up, made them strong enough to wage this battle, and that he ignited this fire in young people. And she felt this tremendous grief that the rest of us felt, too, that Malcolm was gone. But he was only gone physically. They tried to make Malcolm disappear. The anniversary of his death was yesterday. They tried to make him disappear, but the people keep keeping him alive. Because we know, and not because he's a person, but because between these two people, is the intellectual history of black people. They are just personifications of it. The intellectual history of black people is between these two people that emerged at the same time. They both start their public ministry around the same time in the 1950s, and they both die at 39 years old. One is formally educated with a PhD. The other one is self-educated in prison. One of them comes from a healthy, loving, stable family. The other one was put in foster care after his father was lynched by the Ku Klux Klan and his mother was driven crazy and put into an insane asylum. And his family was broken up. One lived the life of the bottom and one lived the life of the top. But both of them committed themselves to black people. And this is why whatever your thoughts are about their political philosophy, we should never denigrate people who put their lives on the line for us. Never. Whether we agree or not, if they're willing to sacrifice for us, how can we not but honor them? All those names we know and all those names we don't know. And simultaneous to this, to the forming of the Black Panther Party and the growing movement of SNCC to become a more international organization in solidarity with black movements and, and third world movements around the country, with the Civil Rights Act in 64 and the Voting Rights Act in 65, and Malcolm having left the Nation of Islam in 63 and becoming this other figure outside of the structures of the Nation of Islam that is galvanizing black people to build independent black political organizations based on the principle of self-determination, self-respect, and self-defense. This movement, this tsunami that had hit the shore in 55 with the Montgomery bus boycott and exploded through all these campaigns in Albany and Atlanta and Birmingham and Selma and Montgomery and Mississippi and all over the South and all over the North. King gives the I Have a Dream speech in front of 100,000 people in Detroit, Michigan before he gives it to Washington, D.C. 100,000 people marched down Woodward Avenue in Detroit around civil rights in 1963. And on the night before King gives that speech, perhaps the most influential black intellectual of the 20th century dies in Ghana, W.E.B. Du Bois, passing it on to the next generation. It is your time now. And this sets the artistic, creative mind that is so deep and pervasive in black communities afire. And with Malcolm's death, a poet living in the village who spent most of his poetic life as a young poet with the beat poets, the kind of rebellious white poets that lived down in the village in New York. And he left the village and moved to Harlem and started the Black Arts Repertory Theater, which becomes the first theater of what became known as the Black Arts Movement. 
And Larry Neal, one of the architects of the Black Arts Movement, said the Black Arts Movement demands that the black artists take a political stand, that the Black Arts Movement is the aesthetic and spiritual sister of the black power movement. One is concerned with the art of politics, and the other is concerned with the politics of art. And this great tsunami now is gaining movement in theater, in poetry, in literature, in film, in music, in dance, every possible creative expression. And what this does is it reshapes the consciousness of black people, the work that Malcolm X was doing to reshape the consciousness of black people, to gather ourselves into ourselves and say the most famous thing that Malcolm ever said, we declare our right to be a human being on this earth, in this day, in this society, which we intend to bring about by any means necessary. We declare our right to be a human being so what does that mean for people who've been oppressed for almost 400 years? It means that you have to not only say we demand our rights, but we demand to be the human beings that we are the way we came here and the way we define our own selves. Our music is our music. Our food is our food. Our language is our language. Our poetry is our poetry. Our plays are our plays. Our symbols are our symbols. I had to do it again. Because ain't nobody doing that. Y'all ain't been to Wakanda. Come on. We need to take you. I got a ship outside. Y'all thought that was a movie, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? That this consciousness we carry with us today. That's why we call ourselves black. That's why we call ourselves Africans. We used to be ashamed of both of those words. You call somebody an African, you would have to fight them. People said once, as Malcolm was giving a speech about Africa, they said, oh, I had nothing to do with Africa. I ain't leaving nothing in Africa. He said, you left your mind in Africa. See, he was a great teller of parables and use of metaphors. The point is that you cannot move forward if you cannot be yourself. And so part of the struggle of black people from the beginning of the resistance through the tsunami to now is how, how can we be who we are and be whole? Du Bois talked about it in 1903, double consciousness. One ever feels his two-ness a Negro and an American, two warring ideas, two warring souls in one dark body that would be torn asunder if not for its dogged strength. This idea of who we are, so what do we do? What do we do in a time like this when our very right to be a citizen and a human being is again being challenged? When the forces who hate us but want to use us, are gathering their strength. When the very organizations that we thought we had beat back and beat down are now in the White House. The Ku Klux Klan and the Nazis work in the White House, openly. They were dragged there, or they dragged that person there, and openly, announced their intention to take this country back. Take it back from whom? The other Americans? Who has it? So this is the thing. All of that transformation of the 60s, the black liberation movement, the women's movement, the Hispanic movement, the, the Asian American movement, the Native American movement, young people protesting the war, all of that changed this country. That's why we're sitting here with a library called the Auburn Avenue Research Library for African American Life and Culture. That's why there's an African Studies Department at Georgia State and at dozens of colleges around this country. That's why there's a Women's Studies program. That's why Chicano Studies exist. 
the transformation of this country to make it be what it's supposed to be. Barack Obama is elected with the new coalition of America. What was that coalition? Black people who voted 98% for him, young people, women, Chicanos, uh, Latinos, gays, lesbians, right? This is the people, young white people, working class white people, this is the people saying this is what America actually is. And then the Republican Party is all old white men. That's the way America used to be. Now, I'm not talking about the politics of Obama. What I'm talking about is the coalition that said the America we want is an America for all the Americans. But they have to be all the Americans without having to sacrifice who they are. We've made that sacrifice for a long time. It was imposed upon us, and we've always resisted it. But the question of what is America supposed to look like now? Well, the one thing we do know is that we're in a fight. Y'all know that, right? It's actually more than a fight. We're in a war. And we have to deploy all that we have first to resist. And we call it a resistance now because we're not organized enough for it to be an offensive yet. Which is why we're getting beat up all the time. We, our head is spinning because it's this, and it's this, and it's this, and it's this. But we have to gather ourselves. We cannot panic in this. We've been through this. We've lived under terroristic governments, and white people may not have in this country. Black people certainly have. Jim Crow was a terroristic government where the majority of black people lived to the Great Migration, where half of them split and went north and west. Y'all got folks up north? Some of y'all from up north? Right. Y'all know that's how we got there, <laughs> trying to escape terrorism. Physical violence and economic violence and the denial of our humanity. We declare our right to be a human being. So what is our struggle in this time? It is a struggle to enforce our civil rights. That is important. We are citizens of this country until you decide not to be. And as citizens, we demand that our full citizenship, all of our rights, be respected and enforced all of the time. That is a demand that is non-negotiable. Why do I say that? Black Lives Matter comes about because of the violation of our civil rights. The police are an agency of the government. So when the police kill people extrajudiciously, meaning without a trial, they have violated the constitutional rights of those people. Those people are treated as non-citizens because the citizens get read a charge, get taken in front of a judge, get a court date, go to court and defend themselves in front of a jury of the peer. That's what citizens get. So if you ain't getting that, and you are a citizen, that means that somebody is violating your civil rights. Somebody's saying, we are not going to treat you like a citizen. We don't have to treat you like a citizen. Y'all heard this thing in Baltimore where they were telling the police to carry toy guns to drop down next to bodies. Two of those cops are going to be on trial. They just got arrested a couple days ago maybe a week ago. If you shoot somebody, throw this toy gun next to them and say that you thought they pulled a gun, a real gun. Somebody caught on tape saying that. But does that matter? People stopped a young man named Freddie Gray riding a bicycle. You know why they stopped him? Police said he looked me in my eye. Y'all didn't know that's why Freddie Gray got stopped? He didn't wind up in the van because he committed a crime. His crime is being black and not being servile. He looked me in my eye like he was in a time machine back in Mississippi walking down the street of Clarksdale and some white people came by and he had to step off the sidewalk and not look at him. That was actually the law. He looked me in my eyes so I told him to stop. And then he wouldn't stop, so we chased him. Put him in the back of a van on the floor in handcuffs, and when he's let out, or when we open that door again, his spine is severed, because he looked me in the eye. He didn't have no rights as a citizen. But that's our demand, that our citizenship be respected and enforced all of the time. But beyond that and before that is our human rights. 
the rights we're born with, the right that the enslaver Thomas Jefferson wrote into the Declaration of Independence. Any of y'all been to the Blacksonian, they call it? You know, the new black museum in um, Washington. Somebody black said, that's too long a name, the Smithsonian Museum of African American Culture, History, Life, and Art. It's too long, it's the Blacksonian. Y'all know how we do it language, right? There's a reason for that. You know, during the period of enslavement, black people modified language all the time so that the people who were oppressed us wouldn't know what we were saying to each other. And then we always had the creative thing going, so we was like, we might as well just keep going with that. So it's like, in that basement, and you all should make it a point to go, there's a life-size statue of Thomas Jefferson. And in the back of Thomas Jefferson is a wall of bricks. And on each one of those bricks is the name of one of the 600 people he kept in bondage. And where their names are unknown, it says unknown. Now this is a person who wrote, all people are created equal. And endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That means the rights that you are born with. So this country, conceptually, is birthed based upon a human rights idea. All people are created equal and born with certain unalienable rights. That's a human rights idea. And we will build a government that is representative of everybody, of the people, for the people, and by the people. That's a civil rights idea. And before the ink was dry, they had violated both of them concepts and continue to this day. And so in this era, in this era, where the violation is so blatant again, after having been beat back and transformed and all of these changes made in this country, you young people were born into a very different society, which is why we should not make the mistake of saying nothing has changed, because none of us rode here on the back of a bus today. And we shouldn't denigrate our ancestors' great sacrifice to give us what we have, but that doesn't mean that the, that the task is done. At the end of his life, Martin Luther King said, there needs to be a radical restructuring. The word radical means to get at the root. There needs to be a radical restructuring of American society. That this is a capitalistic, imperialistic, militaristic and racist society, and it has to be changed at the root. Not just at the branch, not just at the leaf. It has to be changed at the root. And we're at that moment, we see it. Because those forces who want to take it back, y'all know Roy Moore, I hope you don't know him personally, because he's a despicable person. You might go home with some kind of you know, evil spirit cast upon you. When he was asked during the campaign for Senate in Alabama, you with the dude in Washington, you want to make this country great again. When was it great? You know what his answer was? When white people had slaves. That was his answer. It stunned the reporter. He asked it again. He said, when was it great? He said, back, you know, in the 17, 1800s. But that's not an unreasonable response from a rich white man in Alabama. Because since then, he's had to give up stuff. They had ultimate authority over everybody. And in this era, what we learned from black power in the black arts movement is that the artists have to become a mighty army. And they have to strengthen the people's will and inform the people's consciousness. And the art has to be good, which means that you have to work at your craft to say something meaningful and powerful and artistic and creative enough that people want to hear it. It means that all of us have a task, no matter where you are. Everybody's not going to march with Black Lives Matter. Everybody's not going to go to jail. Everybody's not going to sacrifice them, their life on the front line. But wherever you are, you need to be the light. And you need to gather people around some ideas that help us change this country because a bigger task, another tsunami, has to be on the way. We have to create that earthquake in the ocean. We know how to do this because we've done it. 
We are in a remarkable position of having four generations of people who are activists. Those who just got active, those who are in their 30s and 40s, those who are the early part of being seniors, and we have people who are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s who did this. We must go and sit at their feet and learn, get their counsel, help them understand what we're doing so we can get from them the strategies for how to do it better. In this era, we should not be afraid because all of history tells us that tyrants never last. They look strong, but ultimately they get defeated, all of them. Where is Rome? Where is Greece? Where is the British Empire that the sun never set on? Where is France? Where is the poor country of Portugal that had the nerve to have African colonies? Where is Belgium? Where is the mighty emperor of Japan who thought he was God and he could conquer a nation like China bigger than him by a thousand times? Where are these empires? Where are they? The same place this one be. Because ultimately the people want freedom. The people want their voice to be heard in their own voice. People want to live with their families and their communities in peace. But it does not come without a price. And we have to be willing and everybody has to dig in. Whatever you have to do. So I'm going to leave it on this story before we bring some of the people up to talk about this book that they're in. I just read an article about a, a black woman in Montgomery doing the Montgomery bus boycott. Minimal education. She was a cook. Every night, Part of the, the, the organizing strategy of the civil rights movement was to have a mass movement to inform people, and it's also a form of democracy, to get feedback from people who are on the front lines and in the community. What do you want us to do? Will you be with us tomorrow? Should we do this? What do we do today? Informing the community every night, big mass meetings. And this woman would cook all this food every night so that people had something to eat. And they said it was good, too. You know, it was a fried chicken and some yams and greens green beans, you know, some good hearty food. And then she would sell these plates. And she wouldn't take a dime. She would give all the money to the movement. Don't nobody know her name. But you think she's not as valuable as somebody else in the movement? Then you're mistaken. We must honor those people whose names we don't know. But it was a mass movement. A movement of the people. And everybody did a part. Some people only let people sleep on their couch because black people couldn't stay in the hotels. Some people were like the deacons for self-defense and said, Martin, we ain't going to let nothing happen to y'all without something happening to them. And usually people who were like around in the shadows, they ain't got that much courage. So I want to thank you all for listening to this. I hope it helps you think in this era. But our courage is endless. It is deep. It is forged in the bottom of slave ships and on the plantations in the south and in tenement buildings in the north. It is forged over thousands and thousands and millions of people who sacrificed for us to be sitting here having a conversation about it. It is forged in our poetry, in our songs, in our dance, in our language, in our food, in our clothes, in our hairstyles. It is everywhere. If you look for strength, in the culture, you will never, ever be afraid because you know we cannot be defeated. We have not been defeated. Defeat means that you say, I'm done. I submit. If you've never submitted, you've never been defeated. Keep that in mind. Black people never submitted to this. We have never been defeated. We have always fought. Bring it on. We know how to do this. Other communities, you want to learn how to do it? Come hang with us for a while. We'll show you what to do. We need allies. We want allies. But ultimately, black people are responsible for black people. But here's the thing. We cannot free ourselves without changing the world. Because this is not about a person or a group of people. This is about systems that have to be transformed in order for us to be free. Thank you.
So do you have some images? You have some images that you wanted to show? No? Yes? Okay. Um, I was talking to the photo grill. Y'all know what, the, what a grill is? It's a, it's a very honored position in Africa, a person who keeps the history of their people. And uh, Sue Ross is a photo grill. She has documented black people's lives. I've been in Atlanta almost 40 years, and she's been taking pictures long as I've known her. Of every, won't even know she's almost like a mystical character because she shows up at everything. Like you'll see on Facebook the next day, it'll be like 20 events with Sue Ross's photographs in it. How are you doing this? Y'all ain't been to Wakanda. You don't know, you don't know everything. So this book, I'll just read this um, short piece about why we did this book. I co-edited this book with um, three black art movement artists who were contemporaries of Amiri Baraka, Haki Matabuti, who's a great poet and founder of Third World Press, um, publisher of hundreds of black books that would not be in print, including this one. If that publishing company is now the oldest continuously publishing black-owned independent press in the history of the United States, it just celebrated 50 years of consecutive publishing, never stopped. Um, Sonia Sanchez is one of the other co-editors um, who is probably the most famous poet in America. Now I say that because poets are usually famous at universities. But if you want the most famous poets in America, look at the black arts movement poets. Sonia Sanchez, y'all have seen her before? She's small, powerful. But if you ever spend time with her, everywhere you go, people come running out to greet her, particularly young women, and to talk about how her poetry changed her life. Now I don't know no white poets that happens to. They don't go like in the airport and people say, Ms. Sanchez, we got you. Come on, we'll put you in first class. They don't go to restaurants or into the supermarket. Uh, I was with her at Whole Foods one day, and we came out, and this woman who was a cashier had somebody take her register and came running out and said, oh my God, and she got down on her knees and said, Ms. Sanchez, you have changed my life. See, this is what the black arts movement did. And so the most famous poets in America are not academic poets. They're the poets of the people. The third co-editor is Woody King Jr., who is a director, writer, uh, dramatist, and has produced more black plays than any producer in the history of America. In New York, the New Federal Theater is his, but he has produced more black plays, more black playwrights, has launched the careers of more black actors, including people like Danny Glover, Chadwick Boseman, uh, Angela Bassett. They've all been on his stages. And he's still producing, 80-something years old. So those are the four people. I'm the youngest one in this group. Um, that produced this book. So this is the thinking. In January, on the, 19th, on the 18th, 2014, a celebration of the life and legacy of Amir Baraka was held in his hometown, Newark, the city he loved and that loved him. It was attended by thousands of people, mostly from black working class neighborhoods of Newark and many from other communities. The broad representative audience included families, taxi drivers, hospital workers, public school teachers, college professors, scholars, and students. And from across the nation came activists and politicians, Pan-Africanists, Marxists, revolutionaries, reformers, business owners, and corporate executives, Christian ministers, African spiritualists, Muslims, Jews, and communists. In our stage, and in every section of Symphony Hall, was an army of poets and musicians, actors, photographers, dancers, singers, painters, writers, and filmmakers. Artists of every discipline sat amongst and stood with those who had come to honor Baraka. It was a perfect metaphor for who he was, who he chose to be, an artist of the people. With his tremendous intellect, curiosity, and creativity, 
Amir Baraka was engaged in a constant study, learning and honing his skill in order to force from his gifts works that could change a person, a people, or a society. He could have opted to create safety, writing for celebrity and trinkets. He could have, but he didn't. He chose to stand with the descendants of Africa and their sisters and brothers from the places and people of color and other working people and the artists who sing for them and the majority of the people in the world who want life. He chose to stand on the front lines against the death systems and their operators. He chose to accept the consequences of that choice. With his head held high, he charged into the criticism, fought against the attacks and the attempts to isolate him and prevent him from being published. None of it deterred him. Once he made that choice, he never wavered. Baraka produced an unusually large multidisciplinary body of work that included poetry, plays, essays, fiction, music history and criticism, and visual art. He also left behind hundreds of hours of footage of his speeches and the powerful performances of his poetry. He created from, for, and to the people he loved. He was a fearless champion of black self-determination and liberation, always speaking the truth as he understood it and having the courage to change what he understood more. Through his artistic practice and production, his performances and lectures, he taught, inspired, and encouraged us to speak up and out to put our talents to work for the people. Perhaps more than any other group, he demanded that artists take a stand, choose sides, and join the fight. It was that energy, that motion, life lived, creating, producing, working, to say something, do something, to change the world that was the spirit of Amiri Baraka. Woody King Jr. reminds us that Baraka made an extraordinary contribution to African-American world art, literature, culture, and struggle. In recognition of that contribution, Third World Press founder Haki Matabuti made a public comment and a commitment to publish this major anthology. From the first call for submissions came hundreds of poems, essays, and plays. They poured in daily. Our intention was to produce an anthology with work that was in the tradition of, a tribute to, or inspired by the life and work of Amiri Baraka. We wanted a significant book, a collection of writing that demonstrated the depth and force of his impact on so many of us and so many areas of cultural life and political struggle. We pers purposely included known and emerging artists with varying levels of success and skill to remain consistent with Baraka's practice of creating spaces for established practitioners to present their work and also to nurture new voices. When asked about the death of her friend, Amiri Baraka, Maya Angelou said, how do we go on when the poets die? Our great poet sister question demands we have only one answer. We continue to do the work that needs to be done and give birth, give rise to generations of poets full of fire and love like Imamu Amiri Baraka. So uh, let me see who we have here. So you want to just make some comments about photographing Baraka or are you here to, to observe tonight? <laughs> I saw you taking pictures with your phone. See, y'all gonna be on Facebook tomorrow. <laughs> so already there. <laughs> you wanna do it from now or you wanna come up here? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of when I first met Baraka and, and, and it may have been when the um, uh, Congress of African Peoples mm -hmm. came down and, and met here and uh, showed we they did the, the uh, on Morehouse's campus right. in the in the old gym uh, and um, 1970 1970 yeah mm -hmm. that was probably it yeah yeah um, and you know at that time I was probably photographing with a a small camera because at at that time I, I uh, which is kind of what I'm back to with my phone, come to think of it. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of favored the little um, Minolta 110 or Minox kind of, they used to call those miniature cameras, spy cameras and things like that. But I just liked it because I could carry it around and I could go places. Um, and basically I, I took pictures just to document where I was and the people that I was with. Mm -hmm. um, it, was a t it was a period of time when I was in, uh, um, college, it was uh, college, and then uh, 
uh, grad school. Um, I was not, I did not fancy myself a photographer at the time. I was a political scientist, cultural worker, and part-time revolutionary. <laughs> But these were people that influenced my life tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, and having had the opportunity to work with Barack over the years, I worked at the Institute of the Black World. We did a um, seminal project on, the, on uh, black studies back in 1979 mm -hmm. to 81, where we um, assembled curriculum from black studies all over the country and had reviewers look at it and public, publish that which is, it's out of print now, it's not, uh, I don't think it's available, but it's, um, but at that time, Baraka was one of the people that reviewed our literature section. Um, and then he came to Atlanta from time to time up for different things, you know, I mean, he sp came to speak uh, at, at Atlanta uh, Junior College, I remember one mm -hmm. time, he came to the AU Center frequently, mm -hmm. um, and um, National Black Arts Festival, National Black Arts Festival mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, back when it was the National Black Arts Festival, mm -hmm. and when we actually had <laughs> national artists who came, and we had the opportunity to commune, you know, not just at their presentations, because, which were always fabulous, but also at their, uh, at the, in the hotel bar, mm -hmm. which is where most of our uh, <laughs> camaraderie took place. But I mean, you know, you would walk into the old uh, Renaissance Hotel, and hockey would be coming in, and um, Tony Cade Bambara. Tony Cade Bambara would be there, and Eleanor Trailer, mm -hmm. and um, Baraka, and um, then, you know, uh, musicians might walk in. Mm -hmm. You know, Craig Harris and other people would come in. Richard Long was, of course, always mm -hmm. holding forth. He was kind of the center of attention all the time. Um, but it was a great opportunity to interact with black people from all disciplines uh, in a social manner but everybody was, was coming correct and being straight mm -hmm. and having a drink or two at, along, along the way. Um, the last time I photographed Baraka was at Hammond's house when you uh, brought, uh, brought him here. And um, well, actually, that wasn't the last time. It was mm -hmm. the next, that was um, one, of the, one of my favorite times photographing him. The last time he came, he was honored as a living legend right. by the Black Arts Festival when he was getting a little older and frailer. Right. Um, and the other things, uh, other things were just the, you know, we, uh, black people always love to gather around food. <laughs> and we would gather around food in people's houses. You know, we would go to Tony Cade Bambara's house, or we would go to Maya Angelou's house when she lived in Atlanta. And, um, and all the time, those would be great gatherings. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, these were people who were brilliant, intense, um, but were always doing the work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If you get a chance to, um, if you hear of an exhibition of Sue's work, you should really go because the documentation of black life and culture is really profound. Um, Rasuli Lu. I have some on my phone, but I can't, I don't know how to get them off. So I'll, if you want to see them, you can see some of the Brockett's pictures on here. Rasuli Lewis has an essay in here uh, that I'll let him tell you about. He worked with Barack in Newark for many, many years. Okay. So I'm going to sit down if y'all don't mind. <clears throat> this is not for show. Uh, so when asked to be a part of this, I was um, really reluctant because my experience with the MIDI is really personal. And uh, it was long and very quiet behind the scenes, uh, unlike Michael and some other folks in here who knew him as a great poet and could converse with him, as uh, Michael has just demonstrated, uh, I was mostly at his knee and watching. So I came and met him when I was 18, and I came down here for the uh, first meeting at CAP in August of 1970. That was the beginning of my relationship. But I was a typical African-American male who was mad at the world. But I was mad specifically because previous to coming here, I'd gone to two libraries, mostly because I was not uh, feeling confident with myself at the schools I was at. And I used to go into the libraries, go into the basement, into what they call the stacks, kind of to do my work and not so anybody could see me. I didn't want anybody to see how hard I had to work to catch up to them. And the first school 
I found volumes after volumes of things about black people. And this sent me into a tithy. I was, I was so mad I couldn't stand it because I grew up in southern Ohio and uh, I was pretty much insulated from a lot of stuff that was going on because my father was the kind of person he was. Most people did not deal with my dad. You know, and then my dad died. I got angry then. My mother sent me off to this prep school up in Cleveland. And in this basement, I found all these volumes about black people, which of course I never heard of when I was in those schools in Southern Ohio. It wasn't in our household. It wasn't in our church. I was just, where was all this coming from? And why didn't I know about it? So I was mad because of that. Then I went off to a school up in Maine in its basement, I found many, 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 many more times, more volumes. It just sent me into a tilly. I was, I was really not um, healthy because I wanted to hurt people. I literally, that's what I thought about as likes. You know, all this stuff I read about Willie Lynch and cutting people open and letting their babies drop on the ground and having men on their knees and it just made me into an insane person. So I was walking around with a crazy chip on my shoulder. But at one point, I ended up in Newark. And I went to something called a soul session, which is something that a MIDI and his organization had every Sunday. It's a public meeting. People gathered. There was art. There was you know, speaking. A MIDI spoke frequently. And uh, when I first went in, I actually was mad because I thought it felt like church. And I was like, I don't really want to be here. I was like, I'm sorry. I don't go to church. And I started to leave. Then somebody announced a midi baraka. And I had read blues people, and I had uh, had some, ex I guess, exposure to him at Kent State when he came to visit that campus back in the early, I mean, the late 60s. So I sat down, and I waited. And everybody rose to their feet and started saying, nation time, nation time, nation time. Next thing you know, I'm standing up and I'm saying nation time. <laughs> it was too clear to me that I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> but it sounded right. It sounded like something that you could put your focus on. I didn't get it right away, but I stayed and became a part of that organization. Um, for several years, I was new. So, you know, I had to learn. There was a big emphasis that Amity put on all the young people that worked there. And that was, we do two things all the time. We do work and we study, all right? Not the debate. Everybody does work and study. There's all kinds of times where you were called into question so they'd see whether you had done your study, right? And the work was obvious, you had to be doing stuff. And that made, you know, it clear to me, this is about, this, this was good for me because I come from a, a working class family that, that worked, you know? If you're a male in my family and you don't work, everybody's got the crook eye on you. So I grew up thinking that was the right way to do things. But still, I'm angry. And a midi noticed this. Now part of my job at one point was I became his driver. And so oftentimes I'm in the car with just him. And he's in the back seat and he's reading everything from you know, any publication about black folks from anywhere in the world. And of course, he read all the daily papers from Newark in New York, and he was just reading all the time, right? But I guess he noticed that I was still pissed off. You know, I'm just mad, because I, I, I couldn't find the direction I was going in. But the work study thing was helping me. But uh, he said, you know, you can't do that. I said, what do you mean you can't do that? I said, well, what's that for? What are you gonna do with that? And I was like, you asking me? Because any of y'all know that Mitty presented kind of an angry thing all the time. <laughs> Anybody know that? It's like he was like, he was a hot tempered dude, right? And he questioned me about this. And I'm like, it's the pot calling the kettle black? You know, what's this all about, right? But he said, no, you got to understand something. You are part of this group. We do this for a purpose. We're here to build the nation. We're going to save our people. And if you're going to be angry, you got to channel that in to that work, you know? If you can't do that, then you need to probably get away because at some point you're gonna cause a problem that we can't fix and maybe we can't save you. That was important to me. 
that was important to me for the rest of my life. I have lived by that since then. There were some other contributors to that kind of thing that helped me. Uh, one of my professors in college said to me, and to everybody who was in the room, he said, you know, black people don't need mediocrity. We need high quality. We need people who work really hard. And if you're going to be a mediocre student, you're going to flunk in my class, first off. And then secondly, we don't need you. And then you put that on top of what Mitty told me to do and how he directed that. And I was exposed to a lot of stuff that you know, most people would not know about uh, unless you were inside. They wouldn't have known about Mitty's attention to that kind of thing with an individual who was, I was functioning, I was doing my job. You know, I wasn't uh, you know, not doing my job, but he paid attention to me as a person and he helped me to uh, focus myself and to become later on the person that I became and made contributions in other places. So this is all in my little piece in there, which uh, is called Kazi is the Blackest of All. So everybody know what Kazi means? Work. work. Swahili for work. So in 1968, when James Brown said, we black and we proud, we all said yes. And I was one of them. I was like all over that, except very quickly, everybody was saying it. Everybody, even those who didn't mean as well were saying it. And so it was like, what's the difference between my black and their black? And at some point, Mitty and others said, the difference is that for us, the blackest thing is the work that we do. It's the thing that we do to make things better for ourselves and for our families and for our, our community. So Kazi is the blackest of all. So taking that forward, work steady. I'm here in Atlanta, 19. 90, I get a phone call from one of my classmates from my college. He says, listen, I got this program that I'm now in charge of. And what I want from you is for you to come join us up here in Harlem. And uh, but I specifically want you to bring the culture, the ethos that you learned at the Congress of African People from Amidi Baraka. And I want to put that into play with all the young people who come into our agency now, because they're going to be our leaders in the future. And we need them to work their way to that. This is no given. Just because you're a young person from our community don't mean you're going to end up being a leader. But if we can develop this process, go through the kind of experiences you went through with guidance, then we will produce the next layer, the next generation of leaders. And I'm going to conclude with that because at this point, the organization is called the Harlem Children's Zone. And if any of you heard about it, we kind of have a, a national, international reputation. President Obama created a program based on us. It's called Promise Neighborhoods, and it's in 16 cities around the country. But the uh, thing that's more important in terms of what I learned from MIDI is I took that concern for, he had for me, and passed it down. So right now in the Harlem Children's Zone, there are about 32 young leaders. Of those 32, um, they would say 12 of them are mine, meaning that they grew up in my programs. They started off as kids, and they got pushed to college, they got their master's degrees, and they moved their way into leadership, and they are now part of a, uh, a new generation who have taken over the leadership of that organization. So, that's what I learned from the Congress of African People. That's what I learned from Amidi Baraka. And I uh, hope that's. Uh, I think we have. Is Opal here? Opal Moore? Thought I saw. Okay. Uh, Lita Hooper, Alkia, and Boozy, and Felton Edie all have poems in this book. These are some of Atlanta's finest poets. So they're going to come up here and poet for you. Mari um, Malkia's daughter, named after the great black arts movement poet, Mari Evans, right? So I just wanted to point that out, not to embarrass you, but the legacy gets passed on and on and on. It's a poet you should read. Felton and Malkia and Lita, you all want to come up here? And, so we can end this with poetry since it's a tribute to Barack and we're talking about the black arts movement. Yeah. 
you all have a book? You have it? Built it. I think you're on 270. Here you go. Lead it. Felton, they want you to go first. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, because they don't think you can really follow them. <laughs> <laughs> the competitive life of poets. I think it's 262. Yes. Oh. Here we go. I'm going to pull it out soon. Slide it out. Mm -hmm. you go. On one occasion when I um, met Amiri Baraka, I'd met him several times prior to this particular time, but he was here for the National Black Arts Festival, and uh, I had pushed forward the literary celebration for the National Black Arts Festival because in the early days of discussion, there was going to be no literary component. And uh, so when he learned that I had actually kind of orchestrated that or with the help of a lot of willing associates. Uh, I was working for the County Arts Council at the time. And he said to me, uh, you're going to be fired. <laughs> and, uh, was it true? It kind of came to pass, you know. <laughs> I mean, some years later, it kind of came to pass. I mean, I didn't get a letter or anything, but you know, I'm, nonetheless, I was, it, I was done there. <laughs> This poem is called Trayvon's Stand. Boy with hoodie, boy not ready. Boy in dark night, don't want to fight. Regular store run, boy all alone, left daddy home. Man with a gun, a Zimmer man, a killer man. Blood red skittles lost to riddle. Florida town, he stood his ground. Trayvon Martin, now underground. All six feet. There it goes again, the thump refrain. Fallen body, black boy body almost no body mm. Mm. Nice mm -hmm. Thank you very much. this is that's yours this is felton edie for those who don't know his name this is felton edie he's one of atlanta's great poets <laughs> poetry got... kitchen tomorrow night at hammond's house <laughs> see that's the activist poet there like we never miss an opportunity <laughs> to organize around this work. Hello. So I wanted to write something a little different. When I think of Baraka, I always think of boldness and innovation and outside the box. And so the original title of this poem was 10 words for Baraka because this poem is made up of just 10 words. But the title got changed to Baraka. He made us do what we need to do. Baraka, he made us do what we need to do. He made us do us. What we need, Baraka. What do we do what he made? We made. He made us need us. What Baraka made, we need. Do Baraka. Do us, do Baraka, do we. We need what Baraka made. To need, to do, to Baraka, us do what we do. Baraka made us. Thank you. Lita Hooper is actually my favorite poet in the world. I talk to her every day. Do you want to read the whole thing? Do you? Read what you want to read. Okay. The 
corn. Yes. Okay. Okay. I have to ask permission to from the man who inspires me so very much. I mean, he truly lives in the spirit of Baraka, Amelie Baraka, in terms of his work, his commitment, his fire. So we know that indeed, thank you. <laughs> Take, there you go. Okay, we got it right. <laughs> Almost. Okay. That indeed, not only does the struggle continue, but we are in the tradition. And I'm just pleased that my daughters are as well as they do the work they do. And uh, I just wanted to mention to look out for an online literary magazine called Merge Literary Magazine. My daughter is the founder and editor-in-chief, and I'm taking a backseat this time. So it's as it should be. This is called Amiri Baraka, A Pyramidal Presence. And I was asking Michael, should I read the whole thing? And he said, yeah. So I'm just letting you know that I got permission to do this. <laughs> I guess this is what they call one of those epic poems. Almost eight decades of daring, this step pyramid ascending on new truths, each decade a different rung on this ladder, up past depression, up moving forward, ascension a public act a massive movement, progression of people's perfect step, then stumble, then up again, Amiri's growth, very public, very local, very global. How to perch on a pyramid, so sharp, pinnacles of pure passion, spiking, growing, expanding, pulling us forward, boulders and sand meshing, the mouth molding sound into new spaces where life flows into a well of wonder where we drink and are made stronger than we know, more malleable and resistant, more we, less I, always us. He the hammer, we the wrench, he the screwdriver, we the drill, we worked as one to build on truth. This pyramid, this place, this space, this concrete caressing earth, this sun exploding, eclipsing, colliding, embracing, evolving, renewing, moving unencumbered by the weight of the people because love made us infinite, boundless elements of energy floating in the light of truth ascending, making it possible for us to reach the pyramid's peak because he wouldn't go there without us, couldn't be up without the constant bottom beat keeping his balance. Amiri never left this rhythm section behind. Sun-fueled ideals, revolving, propelling on this set of pyramidal promises, sacred space where democracy lives, where redemption resides and renewal washes us clean, red, rebirth, red, rain, washing clear, washing clean, he wrote and wailed where he lived, rested in the village on the streets. Blackness, the warm womb, the birthplace of new movement, created extensions to ancient truths, stretched and pulled ordinary into magnificent, and made mud a salve to heal the cuts of chains too tight. Amiri hung with other architects, building new liberation movements. They shared visions of places where people lived on pinnacles, stretching always upward into the space where truth lives, people extraordinary by their everyday ways. How did he, we, come to this, this red place? He took us on a journey on a road filled with steps where we had to jump to keep up with his reach. Amiri compelled women and convinced men to form armies on the strength of his brilliant analysis, his creative designs. Hmm. He built pyramids of truth formed by logic and magic. Hmm. Amiri asserted and ascertained, analyzed and reevaluated, reconsidered and capitulated, apologized and made amends. Rebirth is middle name, brave and bold. 
unafraid to think new thoughts, speak real words, give old ones new meaning. He gave us tools that break and build, and we worked merging architects and builders and farmers and prospectors and dreamers and cleaners. This man, the real ark, so many crossed over, over to the truth, over to the light. Then he stepped up to another platform wearing Africa on his sleeve and in his heart as he carried vestiges of the old into the new. You have known love if you knew Amina and Bariri, Amiri, the bond bold, beautiful, bright, and badass, loud and soft, strong as a whisper, loud as the wind, rough as a rope, soft as a ribbon. Their love lived for decades, eclipsing pain and loss, in light and shadow, casting forms for family to fold into, love only eclipsed by the sun of struggle, which they soaked up in lockstep together. Every movement, a syncopated step into a higher place of mass resistance. Deliverance from the insanity of injustice, static space, placid places, empirical evidence collapsing empire, faith and facts, ritual and rhythm. He birthed new poems on ancient papyrus for a time when black was uppercase and then stepped over and up to a place where freedom was more than a song found a new church and ancient rhythms rumbled with new syncopation. What was this new music? A new composition, another step toward a heightened sense of heaven where democracy is sacred, a place where empire tumbles and the steps wear away, where democracy becomes the smooth rock and warm brook and free space where we can all live. This man's sun-soaked eyes warmed us with his gaze, his brilliance illuminating ancient winding, winding roads strewn with new technology. He walked with us. He stooped back, got stronger. His stoop back got stronger as it got bolder, bent still, unsheltered frame, strength and elements made more magnificent with age. A mirror kept the fire burning. Cremating stagnation, sloth, decadence, capitalism burning, this decrepit baby, a smoldering mess of foul debris dissolved in the red bowels of the pyramid. Empire felt the pain of burning ash. Justice for those who devoured our dreams and ate our young, tried to perish our potential and stagnate our brilliance. The fire consumed the putrid smells and bloated greed imploded. Empire died. Hmm. Amiri didn't. He resurrected in the smooth terrain of pyramidal promise, freedom, mass movement forward. The movement effortless with the clarity of catharsis, vision clear, globe eyes saw the promise and wrote the road map and carried us forward, stepping on time, in tune. Have you heard a poem strut, a dance drool with delight at the ensemble improvising? Then you met a mirror. Have you seen steel shimmer, metal melt, then mold into spaces thought impenetrable? Then you knew a mirror. Have you felt a sun kiss run down your spine? Then you heard a Mary read and rant and rage and welcome all who entered with good intentions and strong convictions. He embraced the worn and the weary and saw the weary wake bold and bad, pumped up with new truth. If you heard this wonder of words cascading, then you heard this man, this elixir, this valiant victor, this man. His love lives in the words, the work, riffling raw rhythm, rich ritual, real magic, polished, peaking, pure poetic passion. Don't you hear him blowing, blasting bold blue, real red, truth speak, always, forever, eternal life. Don't you hear the cry of new birth? It begins again. Yeah.
<laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. I was one of the young people that Amiri let run around with him when he was protesting and reading and protesting some more and shaking things up and getting arrested and all that good stuff. So, you know, this was um, a little painful because I miss him so very much, you know? There are some people you want to live forever and I have to remember that indeed he lives in the work that continues to live, and the words that continue to kiss all of us. Thank you. So you see why she was like, should I read this whole thing? <laughs> um, I actually should have gone before she read that, but since I'm here. Um, I met Mary Baraka when I was 15, he was in Detroit, um, and I had started reading him even before that as poetry, because my mother always had poetry by black writers in our house. And um, I didn't even know what he was talking about, but I just thought it was beautifully said. And um, one of the things, as Rasuli said, that impressed me out of all of the people that um, I met and knew at the time was he always treated everybody the same. He didn't care if you were famous or infamous or young or old. He always extended himself to you. So at 17, um, I was organizing a group in Detroit of artists and students, and we had started a school. And um, I wanted, I needed more training in what I was doing. And Newark was kind of the more the center of the higher point of our organizing um, in that time. So I wrote a letter to Mary Barack. I was a pretty precocious young person. And I said, yeah, I'm doing this in Detroit. And you know, I got these people. We got this organization and stuff. Can I come to Newark and you know, work with you? And he sent me a very cryptic note back. That was before email. It's like stuff actually came in a letter in the mailbox after the FBI looked at it. <laughs> That ain't a joke. But um, his response said, if you can get here, you can be here. That's all it said. So about a week later, I got on a Greyhound bus, and I went to Newark. And I stayed there for several months and worked with Rasuli. That's how we met. Um, he was an organizer both in Newark and in Harlem. And, um, He's getting anxious that I'm getting ready to tell a story about him, <laughs> which I am. <laughs> when, um, this was a time, a very precarious time. We were under attack by a lot of different people. And um, the black power movement was not so much the nonviolent side of the black liberation movement. We believed more in kind of the self-defense part of it. So I was going with Rasuli to Harlem and um, you know, we were always watching out for these people that were trying to harm us or take us off of being what we were doing. And this was the first day I'd met him. I didn't really know him, but I trusted him because he was a member of the organization. And we're walking down the street, and it's a little touchy, and he says, listen, fear guides me. So if somebody looks like they're getting ready to do something, you need to stand in the back of me because I'm shooting everybody in front of me. <laughs> now, that's not really what he said, right? But I believe that he would. So let me end on this. Anybody have a question before I wrap this up? OK, this is a poem in this book called Incandescent. For us, we, the first fingerprints, descendants of first memories, parents of those first imagined making their way here, we, the necessary dark, not the darkness, a light came on inside ourselves, illuminating our storm of blood and spirit to bathe this earth. Digging poems out of distended societies, we swinging language with light glowing through our teeth, flowing across bloody lips from chocolate hearts, spewing life into a dying world. Thank you all for coming.
Hmm? From the first day we met, people would say, is that your brother? And we just went with it. <laughs> hey, John, how you doing? Listen, I got a... Okay. Okay. Listen, folks, we need you to move to the lobby. I'm going to be out there in a minute. We have books on sale, but they also need to get ready to close this part of the building down. So let's move out to the lobby. Keep talking to each other, though. Let's move out to the lobby so that the folks who work here can close this room up.